compiler construction number 11. Well, we're now on a new unit uh, where we're going to increase the features of our language yet again. So we're going to be moving from the R2 language to the R3 language. And what we're going to do here is we're going to add basically two new things. Uh, so we're going to increase our set of types to include uh, the unit type. Unit is like void. Uh, you know, void is what people call it in, um, you know, like C and Java and stuff like that. But unit is what we call it in uh, programming language theory. Um, and then there's also vector of type. Now, a vector uh, is not an array. A vector is um, like a tuple. So each one of those types could be a totally different thing. So for instance, vector of S64 bool is a type and a vector of a vector of an S64 and a bool is another type. Okay, now the expressions that we're going to add are the following. We're going to add uh, the unit value and let's just write it as, uh, if it's a, as if it were a function. There are also vector constructors. There is vector reference. And then there's vector set. Vector set of an E, an E, sorry, a number and an E. Now notice that these two positions are numbers. So that means that they are syntactically numbers. So this is what I meant by saying that vectors are not arrays. When you have a vector and you, you, you really think of it as like a C structure. So a vector will have three fields, let's say. And when you want to look at the first field, you have to write down zero right there. So vector ref whatever is zero, and that looks at the first field. You can't write down vector ref e and then an expression that would evaluate to a number. You have to actually write down a concrete number. If you wanted, something that you could do in your particular implementation is you can make it so that these things have to be numbers after they leave the optimizer. Um, before they're in the optimizer, they um, before they're in the optimizer, they could be anything. But the optimizer's job is to reduce that to an actual expression, and that would allow you know a little bit more uh, simplicity in writing programs. But ultimately, the point is, is that these are static references to individual fields. So let's look at a little example program. So we go to the program. Let x be equal to 17 in uh, let v1 equal a vector of x, x plus 1, and x less than or equal to 20. And then we'll have let y be equal to a vector ref of v1, 1, in let underscore equal vector set of v1 1 0 in let z equals vector ref v1 1 inside of y plus z. Now this program, what is it going to evaluate to? Well, 17 goes in here and turns into 18, so y is 18. Then we set the first thing to 0, and then we read it, so we should get back the result of just 18, not 36, because this one right here modified it. Okay, so this right here is a quick description about what the language is. The unit value is a value that doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't have any interesting things about it. It, it doesn't mean anything. Um, and it's the result of doing a vector set. Now the whole point of vector is so that we can create data structures. Those data structures can of course live in memory somewhere um, and you know we can inspect them and modify them. This is an extremely minimal change to our language 
it would be really nice, of course, to like implement lists and trees and classes and all those sorts of things, but we're not going to do that um, because we're going to focus on the compiler. We're not going to focus on the language design. The OPL class, you know, the, the other the other class, that one is really about language design. And so in that class, we we think about more like expanding what the language can do. But right here, we're focusing on just the big picture question of if your language has values that have an indeterminate extent, then how do you deal with that in the compiler? And that's really what this unit is about. Okay, so this new language, R2, R3, so R3 has automatic memory management. Memory management. I.e., there is no free. And in principle, you should be able to write programs that have an arbitrary amount of memory that they use. And as long as they don't need an arbitrary amount of memory at any given point in the program, the compiler should generate a program that is allowed to, that, that uh, successfully runs them. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, is that imagine that, you know, we took, we took like our two to the end program and we made it so that the way that the two to the end worked is, is that it created like a giant array and then read one element out of it. Then it created another giant array and then read it, sorry, giant vector and then created, and then read one element out of it. That program, at any given point in it, it would only need one of those giant vectors. So as long as a single one of those vectors was within the amount of memory that the program had available to it, it would be able to successfully execute it. Um, in contrast, uh, you know, if you were forced to have all of the memory available, then you wouldn't be able to run the program because it would be too much. So there's actually a, a task about like purposefully writing a program that uses an arbitrary amount of memory or you know, a, a, pre a predetermined amount of memory that, that you would do something like that. Now we of course need to update all the different components of our language. So you gotta implement your, you know, your pretty printer, your interpreter, um, your type checker, all those things. I'm not gonna comment on how to update the interpreter. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Basically what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to to make it so that you know, there's a new kind of value that represents a unit and a new kind of value that represents a vector. And unit will make one of these and vector will make one of them and vector ref and vector set will modify them. If you're inside of a programming language that already has automatic memory management, then it'll be fine. Uh, and if you're not in such a language, uh, then my advice to you is to just leak memory because it's not worth worrying about. Or maybe make something like, you know, all the memory will be freed at the end of a run of the interpreter. That's just convenient to do. I will talk about how to modify the type checker though. So here are the new rules for the type checker. So gamma is gonna prove that unit has type unit. All right, the next is, is that gamma is gonna prove that, um, that vector of E0 through EN minus one has type vector of t0 through tn minus 1, supposing that gamma proves that e0 has type t0 and gamma proves that en minus 1 has type tn minus 1. And so all this says is that when you construct a vector, all the individual components have to have types and the type of the entire vector is the type of each individual component. All right, next we're gonna have the rule for uh, referencing. So if gamma proves that EV has the type vector of T0 dot dot dot, TI dot dot dot, TN minus one, then we can conclude that gamma will prove that vector ref of EVI has type TI. So all this says is that when you look at a vector ref, right there is a constant number, and we can just read off whatever the appropriate vector is, or whatever the appropriate type is. Okay, finally, we'll have the rule for uh, vector set, and it's gonna take two lines, 
So I actually kind of want to rearrange things a little bit so I don't have to move the screen, move the paper. So let's just move these up. Move that up to there. And then let's move this one up to here. And then let's move this one as well. Well, let's just draw boxes. So this is rule number one, rule number two, and rule number three. Okay, so now what we can do rule number four. So rule number four is going to be the rule for modifying something. So here's, here's the way it's going to look. We're going to say that gamma is going to prove that vector set of ev i E n has type unit supposing that gamma proves that E v has type vector t0 dot 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 t i dot 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 t n minus 1 and gamma proves that E n has type t i. So this says that you can do a vector set if the vector position is a vector i is actually within the range, and en, its type is the corresponding type inside of the vector. Okay, now the next thing that we want to do um, is we want to update our random, uh, our random generation algorithm, um, our random program generator. 1113. Okay, so here's the way that we can think about it. Um, there's a few changes that we need to make. Number one, uh, make it so uh, the random type could be unit. So remember how inside of our random generator we say which random type should we do? Right now we do S64 and bool, so add an option for unit. Okay, now here's the next thing. Like, how do we make it so that we could randomly generate vectors? Well, the problem is, is that uh, there are many, many different kinds of vectors. So we could, for instance, make it so that um, you could imagine making it so that when you randomly pick a number, like, sorry, when you randomly pick a type, sometimes you choose vector. And when you choose vector, sometimes you choose, you would like first pick like, well, how many elements are there going to be? And then once you choose how many elements there are going to be, then what you do is you choose um, like how many, uh, like which element each one of those things is going to be. You definitely, that definitely could work. My personal advice um, is that it's really painful to do that. Uh, because there's too many of these, uh, th there's too many different vector types. So what I did in my version is I make it so the random type um, could be unit, um, or it could be just a vector by itself, so a vector, like an empty vector. Um, it could also be a vector of, um, sorry, of S64, of um, a certain number of S64s, so I, I think I did six of them. Um, or it could be a heterogeneous vector of a bool and an S64. Um, and then I made one more version, which is that I made it so that it could be a vector that contains inside of it another random type. And that means this would then allow you to get uh, nested vectors. And then what I did is I made it so that because I know what all of these different things are, um, then what I did is I made it so that like there's a rule which is just, uh, you know, to get an S64, choose a vector, and do vector ref 
that's it's choose one of these vectors, choose one of those vectors, and do vector ref on a random number between 0 and 5. Or choose one of these ones and look at the element number 1. Or to get a bool, to get a bool, choose one of those ones and, you know, read element number 0. This is not like the perfect thing to do, uh, but it's pretty decent um, because it allows you to get some complicated vector manipulating programs. And you know, the whole job of this random program generator is not to make it so it's possible to generate, um, not, not so that it's possible to generate every possible program, but just so we can generate interesting programs that are likely to get our compiler to go and do weird things. Okay. Another thing that you want to do is you want to write a program uh, that is going to use, uh, that's going to generate a certain amount of memory. So the way I, what I do is I call this program big mem. And big mem takes two parameters, n and m. And its job is to allocate n bytes m times. Now what do I mean m bytes? So we're going to generate a vector that that vector consumes n bytes. And then we're going to do this m different times. Now what do we mean by n m different times? What we mean by that is, is that the vector is going to be um, the vector is going to be created and then it'll be used once and then the next one will be used up again. And the idea behind this is that we basically want to make it so that n is the size of our uh, the size of our heap. So we consume all of the heap space, and then we try to allocate a little bit more, and then it fails, and that causes the garbage collector to run. And we do this m times, so we can control how many times it happens. So we can test: does our garbage collector work with after one time, after two times, and so on? Now here's the problem: we need to come up with a program that would not be optimized completely by the optimizer. Because we haven't done the optimizer yet, but one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to make an optimizer that's going to do stuff like, well, if you have a vector ref to a vector where all the values are known, then we can just reduce it to the actual value. So what that means is that the contents of these vectors have to be, uh, have to be values that are read. And we have to make it so that, um, and we have to make it so that the values that are read are uh, are like unpredictable. So here's my strategy for doing this. So what I do is I make a program where v zero is equal to a vector of a whole bunch of calls to read, and how many are there? Uh, there's n-ish of them. What do I say n-ish of them? Well, because we know that the result of a read is an s64, and s64 is 8 bytes, so really we could take n and divide by 8. So we'll take n, divide by 8, and then that's how many there are. And if you don't want to do this, you could just make it so it makes n of them, it's fine. Okay, so now this vector, its values are going to be totally unpredictable. Okay, so next thing that we want to do is we want to create this is vector number zero. Then what we're going to do is we're going to make vector number one. But how do we make it so that vector number one contains unpredictable values? So here's what I do. The next thing that I do is I generate a vector set. And my vector set sets v0 and then some static random number. some static random number to the result of calling read. So this is yet another call to read. So this, what this is going to do is it's going to force v0 to uh, exist um, independently, not be split up. Because one of the things you can imagine doing with an optimizer is you could, you could realize that the structure of a vector was predictable. Um, and then because the structure of, oh yeah, sorry, I meant to do, I meant to do this differently. You can imagine making a version, making um, the structure of, 
you could imagine detecting that the structure of a vector was predictable. And if you knew it was predictable, then you could actually like split it up into individual variables, one for each one of the values. So what we'll do instead, is what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, we're gonna generate an if statement. And the if statement is gonna say, if when I call read, I get back a value that is greater than five, then in that case, I'm going to do a vector set to v0, 0 of a call to read. Otherwise, I'm gonna do a vector set to, v, to v0 of one of like one plus read. Now the goal behind this is that we're trying to make it so that you can't predict, actually, you know what? It's probably even better to make this a read read, okay? So now what's going on here is that we're making it so that the optimizer can't predict uh, what value is actually going to get changed, whether it's zero or whether it's one, and it don't and it doesn't know what it's going to get changed into. Um, you know, just kind of a background assumption thing here, right? Like we know that our optimizer can't get rid of reads. That's like its main job. Okay, so now that was one round of the vector. Okay, but now the next thing that we need to do is we need to make it so that this vector goes away because it has to become unreachable m times, but it can't go away and never be looked at because then it wouldn't even be needed. And if it weren't needed, then we wouldn't be able to, um, then, we, then we could just optimize it away by just completely removing it. Because again, think about one of the things that you could do. We can make it so that um, we could get rid of a vector if we saw that it never got looked at. And we could get rid of a set if we saw that the vector were never read again. So if we could tell those two things, then we would know that the vector wouldn't be needed. Okay, so then what we'll do is we'll make v1. And v1 is going to be a vector where its values are going to all be reads. Except one of them, maybe like the last one, its value is going to be something like if a read is greater than 5, then do a vector ref on v0 and look at 0, otherwise look at 1. Now what's going on here? What's going on here is that this means that after this vector gets constructed, we're never going to look at v0 again, so that means it could be freed. But we are going to guarantee that it gets looked at at least once. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have v2 look exactly the same as this, except it's going to have a reference to v1 here. And by the way, we're going to modify it too. We're going to actually modify it. Then what we're going to do is at the very end of the program, we're going to make it so that the program ends with subtract x and vector ref vn minus 1 and look at that nth, nth field. And now what is this x? This x is our prediction of the value of the result. Now what do I mean by our prediction? What I mean by that is, is that we're going to make it so that big mem is going to have the, is going to be this big program that has all these calls to read in it. So what that means is, is that we could actually know which values to read get sent in. And since we know which values got sent in, we would then know what the answer is supposed to be right there. And then we can just do a really easy check to make sure that the answer is the one that we want it to be. Okay, so that's kind of a plan. So hopefully that this is kind of gives you an idea, but your ultimate goal is to write a program that uses an arbitrary amount of memory that won't get optimized away. Well, now we can actually talk about the optimizer. So what kind of optimizations do we want to do on R3? We'll call this R3 optimization. Okay. Here are some things that we can do. Um, what we could do is we could detect if a vector 
is never modified. And if it's never modified, we could inline it. So what do I mean by inline it? What I mean is that our code has, you know, vector ref of x zero in it somewhere. And then earlier in the program, there was a let x equal some vector, zero, one, two. And what we could do is we could realize that x, if x is never modified, then we can turn this into vector ref of vector zero, one, two, zero. And then we can turn that into just the, the actual answer. That's kind of a, the, the general idea. But one of the problems is, what if one of these fields right here, uh, what, if, what, if, what, if, what if one of these elements uh, were not pure? Where when I say not pure, it means that it has an effect itself. So for instance, what if we had a vector ref, uh, a vector ref, and the vector were a vector that had zero read and then one, and then, uh, sorry, two. Well, in this case, if we turned this into just zero, that means that we would forget that read. So what we need to do is we need to turn it into, uh, we need to turn it into a sequence where we have the read, which we throw away its answer, and then we return the zero. And remember, sequence of x, y is just defined as let x, sorry, let underscore equal x inside of y. So what this does is it uh, just makes it so that we evaluate x and then we throw away its answer. Okay. Um, what are other things that we could do? Um, we could, uh, What we could do is we could keep track. Okay, so if it's never modified, then we can inline it. And then when we see a constant vector there, we could basically compute what the answer is. Oh yeah, so it's, if it's never modified uh, and pure, and pure, then we inline it. Or if it appears only once, it appears only once. Yeah, so those are the things we could do. So pure meaning that it doesn't contain reads or set bangs or anything like that. And but if it appears only once, then we can do it right now. But of course, you can't move where the effect would happen. So you might need to pull the effect out and then merge things down. So what am I trying to say there? So imagine you had a program like let x equal a vector of read one two. And then you had let y equals read. And then we had an addition of vector ref of x and 1 and y. Okay, so this program right here, notice that x is never modified, but it's also impure. So if you picked up this vector x right here and plopped it into there, and then inlined it so that it became sorry, and then you know folded it so it became just the one and left that read on the side. You could imagine turning this into the following program: let y equals read, let underscore equals read, and then we would have an addition of one plus y. You can imagine that. But this is wrong because this right here is read number one, and this right here is read number two, but that's read number two, and that's read number one. So the effects got reordered. So that's not safe. Your compiler isn't allowed to change the order of effects because that could change the meaning of the program. So, in, so we can't do that. Instead, what you would need to do is you would need to do something like this. You could, you could basically say, like, when we see that a vector is never modified, We'll change it into let x zero equal read, let x one equal one, let x two equal two. Then we have the rest of the program, let y equals read. And I'm going to label these reads, by the way, this is read number two and this is read number one. Then we would have an addition, 
And now what we're going to do is we're going to inline that vector ref right there. So we're going to put right in here x1, y. Okay, so when we detect that this vector is never modified um, and it's made up of constants, then what we do is we just we turn the program into this one. Now this program, then we optimize that. And when we optimize that, what we do is we leave this x0 alone, although we note that it never gets read. So we change that into read 1. This x1 we're going to inline. This x2 never gets read, so we don't even, don't even need it. And then this y remains as read 2. And then we return a plus of 1. That's the x1 inlined. And then the y, which is the value right there. So basically what you can do is you can make it so that when you detect that a vector, um, you know, as I said, is never modified, then we can split it up into these individual variables and then treat those individual variables separately for the purposes of the other optimizations that we do. And that's going to have the consequence of guaranteeing that the effects stay properly ordered. All right. Okay. So now here's the next thing that we need to change, which is going to be a real pain in the neck. We're at 5, I believe. 11, no, 11, 6. Okay, we need to like look at, into the future a little bit. Okay, vectors are going to be compiled into um, vectors are going to be compiled into um, they're going to be combined compiled into things that don't live on the stack. Instead, they're going to live in the heap, right? Because they're going to be garbage collected. Now what that means is that we're going to have to be able to follow pointers inside of vectors to other vectors. So that means that when we get down into the assembler, we're going to have to know for every single variable whether it's something that is allowed to live in a register and on the stack, or whether it is going to be a pointer to something else. And we're going to make sure that there's a distinction between these two things. So what that means is that we have to keep track of um, that they have to keep track of whether or not there are um, basically what the type of every single variable is. Now there's a few ways that we can think about this. Here's one way that we can do it. One way that we can do it is that we can change our type checker. So our our previous type checker, it, the way that it worked is it took in gamma and e, right, and it returned a type, t. But this type is the type for the entire program. What we're going to need to know, however, is we're going to need to know the type of every single variable in the program at every single point in the program. So one strategy is to change our type checker so that it returns a pair of E and its type. Now this E, however, is an E that's been modified, that we'll call it E prime, where E prime is the same as E, except that there's a new case that says E has type T. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that like deep in the bowels of our type checker, there's gonna be a rule that's gonna say, what do I return when I'm given a variable v. And what it's going to return is it's going to return this new structure, v, and, sorry, it's going to return, uh, you know, sorry, let me, uh, let me write this a little bit. And we, we pronounce this, by the way, has type. So it's going to return a has type of the variable v, and then whatever gamma says that the type of V is. And what this is going to do is it's going to make it so that every single variable at every point in the program says, this is what kind of thing I am. So then they'll, we'll have that available for later. That's one way that we can do it. The other strategy that we could do, so that's option one. The other strategy is we could first assume uniqify already happened. 
uniqueify already happened. And if uniqueify already happened, then that means that all variables have globally distinct names. And since all variables have globally distinct names, then what we could do is we could make so our type checker is going to take in gamma and e, and it's going to return gamma and a type. And the idea here is that this gamma right here is the mapping from variable to type. And so our rules would say something like this. So when we type check gamma variable v, it's going to return a pair of that gamma and what gamma says v's type is. But then when we look at a rule like, you know, a type c of a let, where we have let x, x e, b e, it's going to return, it's going to, it's going to look something like this. It's going to return gamma prime prime, I think. Maybe it would be prime, prime, prime. And the body type, where gamma prime, the x type, is equal to calling the type checker with gamma and the x expression. And then gamma prime prime, sorry, we don't need a parenthesis there. And then gamma prime prime is equal to gamma prime with a mapping from x to xt. Then gamma prime 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 and the body type is what happens when you call the type checker on gamma prime prime and the body expression. So the idea here is, is that gamma is like something that goes into everything and comes out. And we remember what things are. Uh, and so now, when we're finally done with the type checker, we can get this variable to type mapping and know what the type of every variable is. That's good, but it turns out that there's even kind of a more annoying thing, which is that when we get to an individual vector, we're going to need to know what the type of that vector is. And that may not involve variables. So. There's sort of two ways to deal with this. One way, so this is like this is like option 2a. Option 2a, um, make a function, make a function that can look at vector constructors and find the type and find the type, the type, or to b, make it so that, make it so the type checker takes in gamma and e, and what it does is it returns all three of these things. It returns the gamma mapping, and it returns a new version of the expression and it returns the type where the new version of the expressions are the same as what they were before except now vectors start off with a little thing embedded in them that says this is what my type is and then they have their fields and the idea is that now part of the job of the type checker is to figure out what the type is in this and install it inside of the inside of the um, inside of the actual data structure. Now, this is one of those things where writing it down like this um, makes it seem more complicated than it is. When in reality, uh, there's actually a fairly easy way to actually implement this, which is the following: make it so that gamma is actually just a global variable. And so that way it doesn't really come in and come out, it's just that you modify it. So mathematically we think of it as that you're modifying it. Now of course we make sure that, um, that uniqueify already happens, because otherwise we will clobber on, on things. And so now if gamma is just a global variable, then we'll be able to just you know, keep, track of, uh, keep track of the newest version of it. And finally, how do we deal with this, like, this thing right here? Well what we do is we make it so that the data structure 
that represents a vector has an, an extra field, which is basically like a memory reference, and then we can just update it with whatever the type, whatever the type we find it out to be. So what I mean by that is that when we, if you write in your program, you know, vector one, two, three, then what we do is we construct a vector object, right? This is like a vector expression object. I'll call it vector expression. And then what it's going to do is it's going to have a little box in it. And that box starts off not having anything in it. And then it has the number expression for one, the number expression two, and the number expression three. Okay, And that's the data structure. Then when we actually run the type checker, one of the things that it does is it fills this in with vector of S64, S64, S64. And by filling up that hole, it now makes it so that we, um, you know, know what, know, know what value it has, or know what the type is. So there's all sorts of different techniques for how you can imagine implementing this, but ultimately what we need to do is make it so that our type checker can figure out, uh, well, sorry, that future parts of our code will know what the type of every sub-expression is. And the main places where that's needed are um, vectors and um, are vectors and uh, and then variables. Okay, so what do we do next? So this is 11, 7. OK. We're going to make a pass that's called expose allocation. And this one takes R3 programs and turns them into R3 programs, R3 prime programs. What we're going to do is we're going to extend the expression language to have three new things. It's going to have collect and then a constant number. It's going to have allocate, which has an argument named number and a type. And then it's going to have global value and then global. Where the globals are some new some new variables. Some new set of variables that are totally distinct from all other ones. Okay, now what is going on with this thing? Here's the idea. The idea is that we're gonna take the logic of vector allocation that we ultimately need to compile and break it down into smaller pieces. By breaking it down into smaller pieces, we will then make it easier to determine when we need to do garbage collection, where we need to do garbage collection, and how to actually initialize these objects. By the way, if you want to think about what these things are, the type of collect in a number is just unit. The type of an allocate request and a number in a type is whatever that type is. And then the type of a global value is either S64 or maybe make it so that there's some database of what the type of all the globals is, where this is some global database. And you can, yeah, okay. 
So, expose allocations is going to produce programs that use these three things. Now, when and why is it going to do that? Here's basically how it's going to work. <coughs> if you gave the argument, so if you, if you had in your program a vector where you had read, and then you had um, like two, and then you had like another call to vector where you had read of, you know, uh, you know, zero or something like that. Then what this is going to do is it's going to turn into the following. It's going to it's going to be a big hunk and chunk of code. It's going to turn into a let where e zero is equal to read. That's the first argument inside of a let where e1 is equal to 2 and a let where e3 is equal to the expansion of vector read 0 okay whatever whatever that ends up being and then after we do that, then what we're going to do is we're going to have another let where we're going to say that blank is going to equal an if statement where we ask the question, is the global variable the free pointer when we add to it four, is that less than the global variable the um, the uh, the from end, and if it is, then we're going to return unit. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to call collect four. Actually, you know what? It's not four. It is, let's see, so that's eight. That's another eight. Uh, well, actually, let's count backwards. So these two are eight, so that's 16, plus another one byte. So maybe we'll need all eight. Um, let's just say that it's just one. So let's say that this right here is 17, plus another 16, plus another one, so 17 plus 16 is uh, 35, yeah, no, yeah, 35 plus 1, 36. So this is going to be 36. Okay. And then that is, this is all in parentheses, of course. And that's going to be in let v equal a call to allocate of 36 with the type vector of s64, s64, vector s64, s64. And then this is inside of a let where we say that vector set of v0 zero is e0 zero inside of let underscore equal vector set v0 zero e1 inside of let underscore equal vector set vector set v0 zero e2 inside of v. Now we close the first let, the second let, the third let, the fourth let, the fifth let, the sixth let, the seventh let, the eighth let. Okay, now what is the big picture of all this? Well, what happens is that if we have a, a vector call, and by the way, this vector call really has, you know, it has this type in it right here, that, that's this type. That's, how, that's why we know what these things are. So we've already type checked this, so we know what the type right there is. 
And so what we do is we pull off each individual component and we assign them to variables. The reason we're assigning them to variables is to guarantee that they are, uh, that they're ordered. What I mean by that is that we make sure that the effects inside of this happen before these effects and happen before those effects. So we give them all very, we give them all values, sorry, variables. Then what we do is we check to see whether or not there's enough free space. So we look at the global variable, the free pointer, and we see if when we add 36 to it, which is the size of this type, basically we have a function that can look at a type and say, how big is it? So we say, if the, what's the size of this type? add it to the free pointer, and if that is less than this other global variable, then we don't need to do anything. But if it isn't less than it, then that means that this will use up too much space, so we need to call the garbage collector and make sure that it can reclaim 36 cells of memory. And if it can't do that, uh, then it will fail. Then, once we know that there's enough free space, we'll call the allocator, and the allocator is going to give us uh, 36 spots of memory, and it's going to record in some way that, this, that, that, that the type of that memory is this thing. And then we're going to install the values that we previously computed into those locations. All right. So what this does is it now makes it so that we can focus on the smaller task of implementing reading a global variable. That's going to be easy to do. Calling an existing function, the collector, which is going to be easy to do. Calling an existing function, the allocator, which is going to be easy to do. These are going to behave just like readint and you know, printint. They're just going to be functions that we're going to call into our runtime. And then implementing vector set. And of course, we'll implement vector with as well. So this is going to simplify what it means to do, you know, our compilation. Okay. You're going to have to extend your interpreter to deal with these new forms of, you know, the global variables, the collector, the allocator. Uh, my advice um, is to just make it so that it's just completely fake. Now, what I mean by just completely fake, so what I mean by that is that you're going to make it so that uh, you know the global free pointer um, is just always zero, just always values to zero, and the global uh, you know memory end. I forget what I called it. I think I called it from end. Is just always something that's always going to be bigger, like a billion or positive infinity or something like that. Then you're going to make it so that collect does nothing. Or maybe you just make it so it errors, so it'll never actually happen, because you know that it, cause it's not supposed to ever happen. And then when you call allocate, what you do is you just give it uh, the appropriate a vector of the appropriate amount of space, of given space. Okay. Once we do that, then what we need to do is we need to start updating all of our other passes. And we'll actually pause now and we'll do that in uh, the next video. Essentially what we've done is we've covered like the, the R perspective of all the things that we're gonna do. And uh, next time we'll do, uh, you know, we'll start talking about like the C and X, per X changes that we need to make.